this computer it's recording and then we can start this broadcast of Facebook. Okay. Give it a second. Yeah, it's definitely a green screen. Okay, so welcome. We are um, doing and starting the VFX for stop motion animation class summer 2020. This is the lecture, uh, the live lecture. Um, we will actually be doing a, a bunch of these for the students that have paid for the course. But of course, the first one is a premiere for all the people that have not paid for the course and who are interested in starting or taking the class. Um, you can sign up at stopmotionuniversity.com. Um, I definitely advise you to um, stick around and watch this. This is basically an overview of what we're going to study in the course. Um, we are going to touch upon a lot of different things. Um, one of the main things that I think is important here and, and to realize is that stop motion may seem like uh, an easy thing to do, but what separates quality and quantity from everybody else is your ability to understand what you're doing and to be able to execute it and then clean up all that work after you're done. Really, there's a whole planning process and a whole process from beginning to end that most people, um, and I mean like 99%, including animators, we're talking animators that work for Leica or Artemis and all these other studios, a lot of people do not understand the visual effects side of stop motion animation. They can animate better than most people on the planet, but even them, they, they struggle with things like green screen or cleanup or synchronization. Um, a lot of that stuff's pre-planned for them. So what I'm offering you in this class is to be able to go through the course, be able to go in with no knowledge and come out on the other end and be able to at least start doing visual effects in stop motion start being able to make your, your videos a next level quality of animation. Now for me, uh, by the way, I'm John, I'm probably up in your upper uh, right hand or left, yeah, right hand corner. And I am John Akuma, I am the head of uh, Stop Motion University, uh, the executive editor of Stop Motion Magazine, owner of Casa de Animation, it's my studio. I've been uh, I'm like a veteran in the animation and television and film industry along with the music industry. And um, I also have, Three, three Emmy Awards in visual effects specifically. So I actually have done quite a bit of work on Emmy Award winning productions. And I've worked on a lot of different stuff in a lot of different capacity from live action to CGI, to stop motion, to 2D animation, anyway, anywhere from music videos to commercials to feature films, to television shows. So we will cover a lot that the skills that I can do, you can also do. And it really just comes down to knowledge and, and experience after time. Okay, so um, first things first, um, we are going to um, we are going to talk about visual effects. Uh, of course, um, visual effects is a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, what you see probably on your screen right now is a green screen psych that I pulled off the internet. This is actually somebody's studio that they own, and uh, I've actually helped build psychs like this in studios. Um, painted them, did the whole treatment and everything, lit them. Um, there is a science to it. There's also a level of art artistry to green screen and chroma key is the other term for, for what it's called. And there are a lot of um, misconceptions. So just because something's green does not mean that you can pull a perfect key from it. Um, there's a lot that goes invo gets involved with that. And I put this as the first, first image for you to see in the course because um, this is usually what people think of as visual effects post-production work. This is what they, they put up on their stages and then they shoot and then they go to visual effects and post and they go, oh my God, I, I don't know what I'm doing, right? And then they throw away all that work that they had done, which they could have po possibly salvaged. Um, for me, um, I can tell you as somebody that's been in the field for a long time, visual effects will come easy over a time period. Over a period of time, it will come easy. The problem ends up when you first get into it, you might hit your head against the wall a little bit. You might have this learning curve that's really, really frustrating because there's a lot to understand at the very beginning. Um, I don't expect you to understand everything at the, at the very beginning. Honestly, I didn't. So why should I expect that out of you? You know what I mean? Um, you should be able to adapt and evolve over time. 
And that being said, let's talk about this course. So this course is going to be uh, between six and eight weeks long for the lectures. You have up to one year to complete the actual course. So that means you can go through the course in your leisure. You don't have to attend all the live lectures. Uh, I would suggest that you at least watch the live presentations because they will be recorded and available to those students that are in the paid version of the course. Um, so you will be able to actually go back and watch the videos and get something out of it, especially if you've lost some information or you didn't understand something, you can go back, rewind, play it back and forth as much as you want uh, for those students that are signed into the course. Um, let's get out of this image here. To do that, let's see, uh, ooh, hold on one second. Let us uh, see, you can see my pretty face here, it's nice and big. Um, let's see, let's um, share another screen with you. I'm gonna share my desktop, it's probably the easiest thing to do here. There we go, share my desktop with you, get rid of that green screen, and my Facebook page. Ah, but here we are, this is the Stop Motion uh, University website. And this is where you're gonna sign into your courses. Uh, this is where you go to sign up for the classes and to access. Uh, when you enter into the, um, the website, the first page should have a login up here in the upper corner. You can use that or you can access it through the student access login button here. Um, after that, by the way, you can sign up through the courses through the shop product products or you can check out the courses through courses. Okay. After that, you will go to your, um, which is under student access profile. You'll pull up your profile. This is my profile here. Um, I have an administrative profile. It might look a little bit more, diff a little different. But um, the things to worry about, the things to think about here is you have um, forums, courses, groups, and friends, and you can also send messages back and forth. I don't really send a lot of notifications through the system because most people don't see these. I send emails, okay? Um, by the way, if you want to contact me, you can contact me anytime through contact at stopmotionuniversity.com. Um, I will look at my emails at least once a day. So if I don't, if I miss your email in the day, it maybe get the next day. So it takes me anywhere between 24 and 48 hours. I am currently working professional. So I work as an independent director, producer, animator, um, character designer, got everything. I do everything. And it, um, my head spins. I just go where the wind takes me. And, um, and so what I, I get involved really heavily in production. Sometimes I might miss emails for a couple of days. So forgive me for that. I try to stay up on top of the quizzes. So if there's any quizzes or anything, I always try to check that to make sure at least that is covered so you can move forward in, in many of the different classes. Um, let's see, so anyway, we're back into this, the profiles. Um, so you'll be able to go into your profile to check your courses. You should have access through this, which will the, through the courses button at the top, but also in your profile, if you click on courses here, you'll actually see that it uploads a page that has a list of courses at the bottom, something similar to this where it says forums, but it will say courses. And you click on that and it will take you to your course. Okay, you could be either, you could be any of them, honestly. Um, you'll have a list. Now, once you're in the course, the courses should look like this. I'm gonna update some of this information also over the, the period of the summer, the summer 2020, which is this actual course right now. Um, and you'll be able to go in here and look at the different modules. Right now, I believe there's only maybe four or five modules that are available. I think we go up to After Effects for Stop Motion and then there's nothing past that. Um, there will be more content in here uh, as you go through the course. Don't worry, it will be accessible to you. Um, but what you would do is you will start off going into each one of these uh, modules. These are called modules. And then when you're done, you'll mark it as complete and then move on to the next module. There's a lot of information in visual effects. So I don't wanna scare you, okay? Take your time with this. If you don't understand something, ask me questions and guarantee you will have a ton of questions for me. I'm not afraid to answer them, okay? I'm here for you. Um, believe me, I sometimes will actually have to reference things and go back and, and refresh my knowledge because simple things for, for that are for me, like for instance, photogrammetry, I really am I'm into photogrammetry. It's the taking photographs of, of one object, many, many, like hundreds or thousands of photographs of an object, putting it in the computer and turning it into a 3D object. It's my passion, uh, my passion projects. I have to constantly go back and refresh my knowledge of that. That's, uh, and that's constantly evolving as a technology. Um, another one is uh, um, I like to build lots of, um, 
motion control devices. Believe it or not, motion control devices are in the stop motion uh, visual effects curriculum. They're extremely important because we have to understand how they work to understand how the camera works in motion and to understand how we fix all those problems at the end and then composite our images together. It's extremely important to understand that stuff. I'm gonna teach you how to, how to kind of dive into that and um, give you a, an overview in those areas. Okay, so we'll cover what the courses are about in the various sections. Let's see, we've got the stages, softwares, all sorts of different stuff, standards and practices. I honestly think that this module right here, industry standards is probably your, one of your most important ones to, to dive into. Please spend some time in this module 401A it's extremely important to understand what the frame rates are that you're working in and how we can adapt to those frame rates. Super, super important, okay? Because frame rates dictate how many photographs you take per second. And that also dictates how many movements you have within one second of one object or multiple objects. So, because remember, we're dealing with animation here and animation is the movement or simulation of life through photograph. Basically that simple. Um, and now that we have computers, we can take digital photographs with the computers. Um, yeah, so, and then we'll cover other things like, uh, for instance, I'll look at stages with you guys. We'll definitely discuss compositing, compositing tools and compositing techniques. We'll get into After Effects is one of the softwares that we're gonna discuss as well. Deflicker, a major, major issue with visual effects is flickering. Um, there are so many factors involved in flickering. I've actually gotten in debates with people and arguments with people that are stating that their flicker is caused by one thing, but yet they're not taking care of the second thing that also cover, you know, dictates flicker or the third thing or the fourth thing or the fifth thing or the sixth thing. There's so many factors. So we'll actually talk about that as well. Camera stabilization, uh, rotoscoping, chroma key, there's all these different things. Dealing with shadows, how to make artificial shadows for your stop motion, especially if you're keying something out and the shadow disappears. Um, Shot cleanup, motion blur techniques, digital mouths. Uh, one of the things that I used to do on, on Robot Chicken uh, when I worked at Robot Chicken is actually uh, mouth replacement. Robot Chicken and some other shows, we did digital mouth replacements um, for when characters were too small uh, or when the animator had a very short deadline and had to do performance, but they kind of couldn't actually take the stickers and put it on the character's mouth. So I will actually teach you and show you how to do digital mouth replacement uh, using a bunch of different techniques, some free software, some paid software. We'll go through the gamut of those. Um, fire and smoke techniques, water techniques for stop motion, uh, color correction and balancing. Um, we'll also cover a little bit of editing um, as well as with shot uh, setup, definitely. Uh, finishing up and delivering. So how do you deliver your shots and all that other jazz. Um, the other thing too, like I mentioned, I'm gonna start adding some stuff as we go in the course. There's some things in here that are not mentioned. Thus, um, scheduling, scheduling for visual effects. That's very important as a visual effects artist. Uh, also keeping track of your shots as a visual effects artist. There's a couple different techniques to deal with that. Uh, working with storyboard artists, working with storyboards, uh, breaking down a shot, um, how to compose the shots properly, um, how the, the lighting should actually be lit in the shots. That's really, really important because a lot of times we get into visual effects as an animator and we, don't really consider lighting as a key essential thing. Lighting is probably one of the most important things that you could possibly worry about as you set up for stop motion and 2D animation and CGI animation, it all makes sense. Uh, it all kind of revolves around the camera and the lights and then your, your performance. Okay, um, planning is essential. So we're gonna cover a lot of planning. Let's move on, let's, uh, where are we at? Close this window here so we have the big window open. All right, so now we're into the class. I've covered like what we're gonna, going to cover for the class. I'm kind of rushing through that because we can always go back and look at those things. But as we get into visual effects, we need to understand a bunch of different things that um, are key essential. And we're going to look at the, some different software options for you. Um, you can take this whole course and get all free software, meaning you can use all free software. You don't have to pay for software to do stop motion. You just don't. Uh, you actually don't even have to pay for software to do visual effects or editing or animation. Um, that's the beauty of our modern age. There's a lot of open source stuff and a lot of stuff that will allow us to um, take our work to the next level without having to spend thousands of dollars like a major studio to use equipment. Um, for instance, if you're in a country that um, you don't have access 
to specific licensing deals uh, because licensing is a big issue with distribution throughout the United States, throughout the world, throughout Europe, through Asia, wherever. So you might have some licensing issues with stuff like getting specific cameras. Um, you may not be able to get a uh, T3i camera. You may not be able to get a Blackmagic design camera. You may not be able to get certain types of Nikons or Sony cameras. Uh, you're limited to what you have available to you in supplies, into uh, lights, into green screen, whatever. The point is you can do most of the work for, with very little money, okay? Just buy a camera of some sort, use your phone, use some free software on your phone, have a Macintosh or, or a, a PC lying around that can handle some of the software, you'll be good to go. Okay, by the way, this class, once again, is six to eight weeks, it's all online. So you don't have to actually go to a physical location and you can learn it at your own pace. All right, so now let's talk about cameras. And we're gonna go into depth in camera in the next class because cameras are, how do I put it to you? They're basically your eyeballs. Um, they're your visual effects uh, tools. Without them, you are not going to be able to, um, you're not gonna be able to meet the demands of your own inspiration. Uh, that's the easiest way to put it. Uh, there's a lot that can happen um, in, in animation where um, if, you, if you don't see something and it shows up in your visual, uh, in your post process for your cleanup or whatever, um, meaning you're shooting something and you haven't prepared to see something uh, in your shot. For instance, dust. You're going to see dust on the lens all the time. It's important to understand the mechanisms of the camera to figure out how you're actually going to clean that up in post. There's some tricks. There's a lot of tricks, but you can actually get away with certain other tricks as well at the, in the production side of things to be able to avoid those things such as dirt, dust, hair, uh, chatter of the set, all that other stuff. So we're going to talk about cameras in the next class, but I want to just give you an idea of what, what you need to have um, as, it's, as it's expected for doing stop motion. You're going to need a camera. That's the, that's the key one essential thing that you need for stop motion, camera, okay? So um, cameras come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. I honestly suggest either one of two types of cameras if you're gonna do something professional. And that would be a DSLR camera that's made by Canon or Nikon. Those are the two industry standard cameras. Now beyond that, there are all these other companies that make cameras. For instance, an, the, another level that's a really amazing camera is the Sony uh, mirrorless cameras. They're extremely expensive. Uh, the series is, I don't even know the name of the specific series. They're gorgeous, um, beautiful image, and they flicker far less than any other, the other cameras. I know this because there's no, there's no mirror. Uh, Lumix is made by Panasonic. Lumix actually has a, um, a mirrorless camera. And uh, those, are, those are useful too to prevent or to avoid the stages of a flicker. So I actually bought a camera 10 years ago or no, maybe less than that, maybe eight to six years ago. I bought it for around $700, very expensive camera. Uh, I recently checked it on the value. It's still worth $700. It's really strange. Um, the megapixels are, are smaller than what's available now, but for some reason it still holds its value and that's a Lumix Panasonic camera. Um, Canon also uh, has a great deal of different variances and so does Nikon. So um, prosumer cameras around $250 are a good entry level camera for doing stop motion. You do wanna have a DSLR like these cameras which you can remove the lens and change them. Um, that is a very essential thing also within stop motion to be able to change the depth of field, the focal range. There's a, there's a weird um, way to describe it is like, when you when you look at the image of a camera, so like a um, and we'll have this in the in the tutorials. But when you look through the the aperture of the camera, we look through the viewfinder. You, the amount of space. Let me show you my hands here. The amount of space that the camera uh, views. So if you have like this, look at the little hole of my hand. So I'm looking through this little hole. I'm limited to this amount of space that I can actually see. As I open my hand, I get more and more image more and more image, more and more image, more and more image. That's how a lens works. So things called macro lenses versus um, non-macro lenses like zoom lenses, they're, um, a macro lens dictates how wide of an image you're gonna get. And professionally, people love to use macro lenses because they go, 
this is my fixed ratio. This is how big the image is going to be for me. I'm going to see it this big. Um, I personally work back and forth through lots of different things. Um, you can use a zoom lens and not get flicker. I've heard people say, oh, I get flicker all the time with the zoom lens. Yes, that may dictate either your lens or your environment or your setup. It, it's all relevant. So I want you to just be aware you can get away with a bare bones um, camera package right out of the box to start doing professional stop motion animation. Though the lenses, these replaceable macro lenses, the more expensive lens you have on the camera, a lot and the better quality megapixels, how big the pixels are, or the count of pixels, sorry, will dictate the level of quality that, oops, here, let me share my screen. I'm, I'm actually not sharing my screen. Give me one second. Um, will dictate the level of quality that you're gonna see. So when you take these lenses and you pop them off, put a new lens on, you can definitely have a very, very, very high quality piece of glass that will give you a gorgeous, gorgeous image. We're also gonna talk about uh, formats because there's a lot of formats in visual effects in production. Uh, color space, um, you'll sometimes hear people say Apple ProRes 422, LT, HD, or Apple ProRes 4444, or Intermediate Kodak is never used anymore, or Interlace, or 1080p, or 4K. All these things that I'm throwing at you, uh, they, are, they are really, really like um, technical stuff. And as a visual effects person, as you get into visual effects, the technical side of things will wash away. It won't, it won't matter so much to you because you'll understand it and you'll more focus on technique. So all this hard, complicated stuff at the very beginning is actually really not that hard or complicated. We'll, I'll try to keep it really simple for you. So break it down into a way that um, you'll understand it. And this all starts with the camera. So next week we'll, we'll dive into that. Okay. Softwares. We have determined that we need a camera for stop motion. The second thing that we probably need, and I say probably, it's not mandatory, but probably need is uh, frame capture software. Frame capture software basically is a software that uh, connects to your camera in some manner to give you a preview. Um, it also may be able to control your camera. Now, why am I saying may be able to? Because, um, or preview, the, the software does, is not the animator, you're the animator. But the software allows you as a tool to be able to manipulate and do things in front of the camera or behind the camera that you couldn't do without it. Or if you were gonna do it without it, you would have to have quite a bit of knowledge, experience, and practice. So uh, for instance, green screen. Doing green screen is pretty much set up the green screen, light it properly, make, make sure what you need to have is in focus, um, your depth of field is set, your camera shutter speed is set, all this other stuff is set, your aperture, everything, um, your ISO, and then what is the object, the motion path, all these different things. Are you having flicker in your shot, blah, 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 blah. It's hard to detect, to detect all those things and set up all those things without a software. So the software is kind of like um, a nice little buffer between you and the technique, okay? The softwares that are important, well, I should say that all softwares can be important, but the ones that you hear about the most are DragonFrame. Uh, that's the first one you hear the most about. DragonFrame is the industry standard for stop motion within the professional realm of animation. Uh, all the major studios use them, Leica, um, uh, Stupid Buddy Studios, Shadow Machine, Artemin, all of them. Uh, the, and by the way, that's there's not only four, there's maybe, you know, say about 50 big studios around the world um, that are producing stuff for feature films or for um, television and film. And then underneath that, there's thousands of little small boutique studios. Uh, I own a small boutique studio. Uh, so uh, I, my studio uses Dragon Frame and we use Canon cameras with Nikon lens, Nikkor lenses and Canon lenses. Um, we also do motion control stuff and blah, blah, blah. All right. So to do all that work though, however, you need to have a software that can multifunction, can give you a lot of preview imagery, can give you a lot of uh, cheating technique, I would like to say, I like to call it that. Um, that means, that means uh, you know, setting motion paths, pre-planning your, um, your dialogue, your audio. Uh, Dragonframe handles a lot of that stuff. They have a lot of, uh, Diami and um, Jamie Cleary, they have a lot of input into the software. This is their company. They design it, they make it, they use it. Um, you can see it's been used in all these different films that are listed here in the video. Um, and they have a lot of um, 
support. So if you wanted to buy a camera that we were talking about a second ago, um, and you don't know what kind of camera to get, the first thing you need to do is go down here into the Dragon Frame section and look at the camera options. Um, and they will give you a list of different uh, options and how to set up your camera and why it's set up in the way it is. Uh, so you can see all here, these are all the different cameras that are, are usable. Uh, by the way, also you can get, a, get away with this course in using um, a web camera. Uh, definitely you need to have at least an HD, uh, like a 1080p web camera but um, it's not important. You can just use a DSLR, but you will need to, to have some kind of camera to do the stop motion sections of this course, okay? All right, uh, by the way, they also have tutorials. So if you need to learn some stuff about the software, you can learn it from, from them here. Um, they have blogs and some other stuff going on. They also make a lot of products. Uh, we'll discuss these um, in, in depth later on. Um, I am actually gonna teach you Dragon Frame. Uh, I'm not gonna give you the certification course breakdown uh, class, but we are gonna study the very basics of Dragon Frame. So if you're afraid or terrified of this software, like Dragon Frame software, don't be. I'm gonna run you through it and you're gonna have a pretty good knowledge to get you up and running and going and doing a lot with this software for setting up for visual effects. In fact, a lot of our practical visual effects work is gonna be done with this Dragon Frame software in my studio at, at, Stop, uh, at uh, Casa de Animation in Mexico City. So uh, right now we're in my apartment and you're in my office. So uh, you can see all the stuff behind me uh, for building puppets. So um, let's see, let's move forward. The second software that I need to point to you at, point at to you um, is called Stop Motion Pro. Now Stop Motion Pro, it was the leading stop motion software before Dragon Frame. It was the most popular at one point. It was extremely expensive, uh, but they reduced the cost when Dragon Frame came onto the, came onto the field. Um, this used to be the exclusive software for all studios, just like Dragon Frame is exclusive software now. Stop Motion Pro was used on a lot of Wallace and Gromit productions. Uh, the Were Rabbit one was, was probably the best example. Uh, was also used on Pirates. Uh, we used this um, early, early Robot Chicken used this. They don't use that anymore. Uh, all sorts of studios use this. So it was, it was the software we could actually incorporate DSLRs or web cameras. And it, it has a lot of the same functionality as Dragon Frame. Um, but Dragon Frame has kind of, it's Mac and PC and Linux based. So you can use it in all sorts of platforms. This specific software, Stop Motion Pro is only available on uh, PC, but you can do it you can use this software if you have a, um, how do you say, bootcamp and you have XP or, or Windows of some sort, not XP, sorry, Windows of some sort that you want to use for, for um, if you own this software or if you wanted to get a license. This has a cheaper license than Dragon Frame. So if, if you're looking for a cheap alternative to Dragon Frame, this would be it, okay? Um, it has an affordable license. There's a bunch of them. It's Eclipse. They also have a lip syncing software and some other stuff. Um, they give you some camera support and uh, Ross who owns the company, really nice guy. Um, he will help you out as best he can. Um, and so there is support with this software um, and it is very popular by the way. It's, Dragon Frame is not the only software in the industry. This is also used by small boutique studios. Um, so just be aware. Alternatively, you can use your phone or your tablet. You can use a Mac PC or sorry, a Mac iOS or an Android phone, or I think maybe even a Chrome. I'm not sure. I think Make Pro might support this as well. Uh, but this is Stop Motion Studio. It is a free software. So you can use this and get away with using it in the course. Um, you will have some issues though, however, great software. So you will have some issues with um, getting this into your computer and being able to use the, um, there's another workflow to get this into the visual effects software. But I wanted to point to this to you just so you can get started if you don't have any options. The, and last, I didn't have it on here, here, but there is a software called Helium Frog. And actually I, I put a list up of softwares that you can use, but there's a software called Helium Frog, which is for PC. It is a free software also that you can use, um, that you can get online. Okay, now let's keep going. Visual effects ha uses a lot um, and I mean a lot of different softwares. There are so many different choices. For one, um, we're dealing with stop motion. So we already covered stop motion software, but then you get into like CGI and editing and compositing, um, motion tracking, um, you name it, photo softwares. I mean, there's just so many different things you can do with visual effects. There's like filters and plugins and things called LUTs and, uh, you know, stabilization softwares. There's just, it's, it gets mind boggling and crazy. 
um, when you understand the core basis of visual effects, like when you get into the guts of it, you should not be afraid to be able to explore other softwares. In fact, that's one of the fun things about visual effects. You're never gonna stop learning because it keeps evolving. Um, one of the things that kicked Ray Harryhausen out of the stop motion, or not stop motion, but animation, but out of the mainstream animation field back in the 80s, was he saw that CGI was on the forefront and coming. At the time, you needed to be a programmer to get into CGI. So Harryhausen was like, ah, I'm good. I'm just gonna retire with this Clash of the Titans film. I'm gonna, I'm gonna step aside, I've done enough in my lifetime. And he was, he was actually a big man to, to say that and to know when he was kind of tired of doing it, uh, tired of Hollywood and wanted to move on. Um, another example would be Phil Tippett. Phil Tippett, uh, and let me type in Phil because he's such a great guy. Um, Phil Tippett, let's do this. I will open a new window and give you Phil Tippett preview. Let's see, new window, Phil Tippett. Oops, there we go, Tippett, there we are. Okay, so if you don't recognize this guy, uh, this is Phil Tippett. And Phil Tippett, and definitely you have to see this image down here in the, in the lower corner where he's working on at ats from Empire Strikes Back. He, and he's playing with the Tauntaun up there, posing with it there, posing with it there. You know, he was the visual effects guru for Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And he is considered a stop motion icon of all of, of modern times. Uh, he's still around, he's still working, his studio is still functioning and doing amazing projects. He has a recent project was Mad God, where he did one of the very first CG, or not CGI, um, uh, stop motion VR productions. Um, so he's, he's, up there, I'm one of my one of my heroes. Let's put it to you that way. He's one of my heroes, uh, and he should be one of your heroes also. One of the things that he had done, though, however, and that why we're in our modern age of digital CGI was when Jurassic Park came around. Phil Tippett showed Steven Spielberg a uh, stop motion screen test. Spielberg loved it, but wanted something more realistic. So then his crew presented him presented to Spielberg. Uh, and in front of in front of Phil, the CGI version of a dinosaur. That alone sold um, Steven Spielberg. Went wow, this is amazing. Uh, let's go this direction. And Phil said, "Okay, I'm out of a job." But instead of Phil quitting, Phil embraced it and learned the technology, or had his crew learn the technology, and moved forward in developing the technique for uh, Jurassic Park uh, for making those dinosaurs. That was revolutionary at the time. If you were alive at that time period, um, it was a very big deal. I remember being a, you know, a teenager going to the movie theater and going, it was my Star Wars moment. It's like, oh my gosh, I've never seen something like this before. Okay. So Phil has actually been on the, let me say, the revolutionary edge of visual effects. He is a, a visual effects guru. Actually, he's a special effects guru as well. Um, and let me redefine this for you really quick. The difference between special effects and visual effects is, Special effects usually are in camera. Um, things like plates, uh, explosions, um, forced perspective, uh, anything that's done really in the camera. That's usually called a special effect. A visual effect is something that's done in a post process. Um, that's usually how we define it. You can define special effects as visual effects and visual effects as special effects. Up to you, but the lingo really is special effects in camera, visual effects in post. That's how it goes. Okay, close that out. So the stop motion software. That being said, let's talk about softwares in, whoops, and I didn't, yeah, I stared at the screen with you, sorry. Um, let's talk about CGI softwares, compositing softwares, editing softwares, and, and planning softwares. There's a number of CGI softwares out there. The number one free software on the, on the play, playing field is called Blender. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you, Blender is massive. It takes a long time to, to really master the software. In fact, I don't think you could master it if you wanted to. There's so much in it. You could master a section of Blender, but to get the whole gamut of everything that Blender does, there is a whole team of people that design and build Blender. Um, it's an open source software that lives off of donations. And, uh, and grants and stuff like that, and fundraising. Uh, it is free. It is, I would say it's equally as powerful as um, 
It's the highest end CGI softwares and offers more than those softwares. Why isn't everybody using Blender? Well, because there's too much to it, I think, honestly. But that being said, it is a free software. You can use it um, for a lot of things. Let me scroll through here and see if they actually show you some of the stuff that's going on here. You do CGI characters, there's rendering in there. Um, you can model build, sculpt, and UV. You can do visual effects compositing in Blender. Um, animation and rigging, of course. Their rigging setup is amazing. Um, I just put that out to you. Uh, you can also do 2D hand-drawn uh, with their, uh, I don't think it's called wax pencil. Uh, so you can do 2D animation in Blender. Um, and then you can do uh, visual effects, uh, color correction and compositing and, and like just a whole, a whole slew, a whole gamut of different things within Blender. Blender also has um, uh, particle animation effects. So you can do fire and smoke and water all and, and um, dynamics, like hard dynamics, which is where you take a hard object and hit another object and it explodes or knocks it down, like bowling pins or a building. You can also do soft body dynamics. So cloth going over an object or blowing in the wind. So those are some of the things that Blender does. It is extremely powerful. Um, and I'm not gonna lie to you, it's not something that um, I would take lightly in your exploration of softwares. Uh, if you're going to do any kind of serious um, investment of time um, into visual effects um, and you want to know something that you can use across the board in any city, any state, any studio, any production, it'd be Blender. Okay. But that being said, it's not, it's not the most um, user-friendly. So uh, it has a very high learning curve. The next software, um, and actually, I don't know why I put that there. Let's see, go here. Uh, the next software that we're actually going to look at, um, the software that I'm going to use for my CGI elements that I build, um, I actually use quite a few different packages, but my personal favorite package is actually Lightwave. Um, Lightwave, the reason why I like Lightwave is it was designed for television. Um, New Tech was a company that was designed by one guy. Um, he created what's called the Video Toaster, which was the first visual effects uh, software slash computer system integration for the Commodore 64 or the Amiga. Uh, and I think it was the Amiga, sorry. And anyway, um, it was integrated and then he evolved it to both an editing system, which is separate from Lightwave and then the CGI stuff, which is Lightwave. A lot of the early uh, Star Trek TV shows, their outer space scenes are all built in Lightwave. Um, then you also get into uh, what's the Babylon 5, a lot of uh, Sequest uh, 3000, I think. There's a lot, just a lot of television shows that use Lightwave to, to produce visual effects. The reason for that is sheer speed and uh, quality that you can get out of Lightwave. It's the fastest CGI software I've ever used. Um, I've used CGI softwares like Maya, 3D Studio Max, um, the whole gamut, Cinema 4D, you name it and they are not very fast. Um, I've actually raced people in production <laughs> to see how fast they get the work done on my end. And usually I could finish the work before they could and then I did their work. So that's why it's a little controversial for me to say that, but it's true. So Lightwave is one of those softwares that's really fast as a CGI software. I'm actually gonna open it up in a second and show you. And we're gonna talk about um, three-dimensional space, but it's, it's just incredible um, for what I need it for. That being said, it doesn't have everything. So like Maya has almost everything. Cinema 4D, almost everything. 3D Studio Max, almost everything. Lightwave doesn't have almost, it doesn't have everything, okay? Lightwave is missing some nuts and bolts, um, but that is not a problem because you can get those things in other softwares. In fact, there's other packages that offer specific things like Houdini is a software that is really, really powerful that you can do all your dynamics in and bring those into Lightwave. So you can, and you can get away with a really cheap version. The other reason why I like Lightwave is their uh, business model is different than the other companies. You buy your license of Lightwave, you can use it on any computer anywhere in the world, as long as you're the one using it. Uh, you can install it, any computer anywhere in the world, as long as it's a computer you're using, okay? Uh, you have to, uh, and the license travels with you because it's licensed to you, not your computer. They're the only company that I know that does that as a visual effects or as a CGI company. All the other ones, you either have to pay a 
rental license, it has to only live on that computer. And then you have to pay a second rental license for another computer or a third license for another computer. So as you go from studio to studio, studio, you have to move your license if they allow you. So that's a problem, especially as a visual effects artist, um, that becomes an issue. The other thing too is the renewal of this software is maybe once every year, you don't have to renew it. If you don't want this version, stay with the version you have and wait till they get to a version that you like, or they have a function that you need, or you need to update your computer and you're going to have to get the upgrade anyway. So those are some things to think about. And we'll talk more about Lightwave and then this will be my go-to. All right. GIMP. Okay. Now what can I say about GIMP that is, is negative? Uh, probably nothing. GIMP is the poor man's Photoshop. Um, it is a software we will explore. We won't use it terribly a lot. I will actually give you a rundown in one lesson um, that will be a pre-recorded. I'm not going to do it as a, um, a lecture because the uh, it'll literally take me maybe two or three hours to actually give you that lecture. And instead of you watching that whole lecture, I'm going to edit it down um, to give you the fine points because um, GIMP has a weird workflow for me. It's different. Um, and also I want to make sure that as I'm going along, I'm being correct with my instruction for you because my use of GIMP is actually um, sporadic. I use a lot of more Photoshop because I use a lot of more After Effects and I like to incorporate the two. Um, but GIMP is one of those softwares that if I'm working at a studio, they can't afford uh, to own or license a, an After Effects or a, a Photoshop software. Um, we usually go to GIMP to be able to clean up shots. Um, this is our, our free, cheap, uh, on the fly, low power, that's the other one. It's very low power versus using a lot of uh, juice for the other softwares and it will allow you to do a lot of visual effects within this software. The other, the other factor too is when you're using a Photoshop software, you can build a lot of elements that you can incorporate into um, your visual effects. So this is a, a very powerful software in that regard. We can do a lot of building. It's also open source and it's free. So you should feel free to actually just download a version of it and keep it on your computer just in case. Okay, next, storyboard software. All right, <clears throat> now storyboard software, and, I, and I'm gonna cover Photoshop in a second, but storyboarding is one of those things that you do need to understand to plan out your shots as a visual effects artist. Um, visual effects supervisors don't typically storyboard, but directors do. So if you're making any kind of animation and you wanna be a visual effects director or special effects director, you need to be able to read and interpret the director's uh, storyboards and improve upon them. So sometimes you might have to add stuff to a director's storyboard or you might have to change something. Um, you can do this in editing software. So we can take a, a still from a storyboard and, and do some uh, animation to it in a, in a editing software um, to give us the impression of movement. Um, so we can plan out our, um, our camera movements, our dynamics with the camera, okay? Um, the other thing to think about here is being able to storyboard on your own is very essential. This storyboarder software by Wonder Unit is free. It's available for, I think, Mac and PC. Um, don't quote me on that. I think, though, it says down here at the very bottom. Oh, it's just a long page somewhere around here, but I believe it's available for both, and it has a lot of um, functions. You can draw directly in the software or you can draw on a piece of paper and, and scan it with your phone and bring it into this software. So there's a you can scan on your computer uh, scanner and bring it into the software. It's really powerful in that regard. And then also you can bring in CGI models and, and move and manipulate CGI models in the software to set up shots in a virtual and a VR environment. Okay, very powerful. Definitely suggest you download this software and install it on your computer. It's called uh, Wonder Units um, Storyboarder Pro, or not Storyboard Pro, Storyboarder. Um, there are other options, uh, like for instance, Toon Boom offers a Toon Boom Storyboarder Pro. Uh, expensive, bloated, and not necessary. You do not need that software. Unless you're working for like The Simpsons, it's not necessary. Um, there are a lot more advantages to using um, Storyboarder Pro versus Storyboarder. Uh, or Toon Boom Storyboarder, uh, Pro versus Wonder Touch Storyboarder. And that, those would be usually integration within a work production workflow in a large, larger studio. That's why you would use it. Otherwise, just stick with the software. Okay, let me move forward here. To cheat at making images, I highly suggest you look at doing Daz 3D. Daz 3D is a free software, again, that they make their money off of selling models, okay? But, uh, if you are 
into the cheap, like all of us, I think, are into the cheap, being able to do things on a budget. Um, and you want to sell an idea to a director or a director of photography or even a producer or a client, you need to be able to visualize the shot. And let's say you can't draw the image, you can always bring it into your idea into posing characters within Daz Studio. So Daz Studio actually takes CGI characters that are pre-built, that are already rigged, already have clothing and stuff, and you can and you can buy props and rooms and sets and products and whatever else through their storefront, which is up here, the shop, and you can create imagery. And these imageries can be manipulated and turned into storyboards. I use this when I have a very tight deadline and I do not have the time to build a virtual set to demonstrate to my clients. Um, because they ha I have pre-built buildings and rooms that I can probably open up within here, pose a character really quick that already have pre-built poses, pose them, set up the camera, blah, 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 boom, I'm set up, okay? And then you can get some really good renders out of this software as well. Um, you can download it for free. It's a free software, download there. You can buy models through their shop. So the next software is DaVinci Resolve. Uh, right now they're on version 16. I they don't know when they're gonna come out with 17, but you can anticipate coming out soon. Um, as having been somebody that's worked for 20 years in the visual uh, field of uh, television and film, I can tell you that we have changed techniques. Well, techniques are pretty similar, but we've changed the software and the hardware that we've used over the past 20 years. So I used to actually uh, edit on uh, a tape deck, these tape reels, the giant things. And uh, that's how I learned was actually editing on tape decks. And um, that used videotape, these long, big reels. Um, and then from there, we ended up using small beta cam tapes uh, and then other things, all tape based. Now they don't really do tape. Tape is um, antiquated, old, and useless in a lot of ways. It has degradation meaning it, it, it corrodes over time. So the quality of your video on tape will actually go down. But if you're in the digital realm, it won't. It won't degrade. You can get generations out of changing um, codecs and formats, you can get degradation. But overall, you can keep working on the same source footage and not have to have that degradation. You can also go backwards and go to a, a, a source material where you really would have a hard time doing that with tape, especially as you're adding effects to it, okay? So DaVinci Resolve is the free software made by Blackmagic Design. And we've gone a long way from going from like, um, what is it, there was other softwares out there like Media Composer and Final Cut Pro that weren't free, you had to pay for them. Um, but as softwares went out of fashion, as new softwares came into play, um, it became harder and harder for these companies to charge a premium price. So they have to keep lowering the price. Well, now we're at a point where it's Blackmagic Resolve wants to sell you a camera and you should use their software. And they have paid versions for this software, by the way, but their DaVinci Resolve software, uh, which started out actually as a color correction software, um, is really powerful, extremely powerful, and allows you to do a lot that you couldn't do in other softwares. So, I definitely suggest that you, you download a version of, of DaVinci Resolve and install it on your computer as well. It's free. Not only is it a, uh, an editing software, it is a built-in visual effects software called Fusion. And it is also a built-in audio suite. You can do audio recording and mixing and editing and um, sound effects and lots of different things. See, so here's the visual effects side of things. And uh, color correction, which it started out as. Uh, let's see, keep going. And then the audio suites, uh, mixing, and you just keep going. It's just got so much to offer. And the beauty of this software is it offers you lots of codecs, but you can use your GPU, which is actually your graphics processor, to, um, to, be, to be able to uh, control and manipulate your, um, close this windows, control and manipulate your, um, your, your footage, meaning you can render out rapidly whereas normally you wouldn't be able to you'd get stuck with uh, something specific like uh, a CPU render would take a long time, a GPU render would happen really fast, okay? So that should actually help you there. Uh, close these softwares out, boom, boom, boom. And okay, we'll move out of DaVinci Resolve. That's, that's the one, it's at Blackmagic, at blackmagicdesigns.com. Okay, <clears throat> now let's talk about Adobe. 
Um, Adobe is, uh, Adobe is, I'm going to, I'm going to hate to say this, but it's my favorite visual effects software. The reason why I hate to say that is because it's Adobe. It has a lot of, it's, I, it's the software visual effects that, um, one of the softwares I started on. Um, I started back before it was even, uh, cause now they're in CC that first they had, uh, before they had CS, they had just the numbers, Adobe one, two, three, four, five. Right. And then they went to CS, uh, creative suite. And then they went from that. Actually, I think there was something before CS and then they went to creative suite. So I've been back before they were even CS. I've been using it that long. Um, I love the software. It has a it's extremely powerful. It has a lot to offer. There's a lot of integration choices. You can use a lot of different types of software with this software and go back and forth and bounce. It is a lin it's linear uh, where it's not nodal based. The Fusion or the uh, um, or DaVinci Resolve is, is nodal based, which is similar to Nuke or Shake, which is an old software. After Effects is linear. So um, you, and we'll talk more about this in a, in a in the future, but it basically has a timeline with layers and we have to deal with those layers in a linear fashion. But we, if we want to go back, we have to create a workflow that allows us to go back to fix something. So we actually do things like pre comping. Um, so we work like along a line. It's the best way to describe it. Whereas a node base, you can take this node and attach it to that node here and then one down here and you can bypass and do all these other things. You have nodes everywhere. You know, um, hopefully you're looking at my video over here on the side where I'm, I'm posing my hands and acting crazy. But nodes are like little modules that you can link and connect. Um, After Effects, however, uh, is super, super, super powerful. It's also a little easier. I'm going to say the learning curve is actually a lot easier to learn than say something like Fusion or um, uh, Nuke, which is the industry standard for a lot of productions or any other nodal based softwares. Okay. We will go into DaVinci Resolve, but the majority of the visual effects demonstrations that I'm going to show you are going to be done in After Effects. And the reason for this also is because most television shows um, that are stop motion are going to be done in After Effects. Most of them. It's just hands down. That's, what's, that's how it works. Um, there are others that use uh, Nuke who can afford it or other compositing softwares like Flame or... Uh, what's it, there's another one, Smoke. Those softwares, uh, they're extremely expensive. They're boutique softwares. Only a few studios use them. Not necessarily useful for what we're going to do. After Effects is, feels like it's been built for stop motion. I've used it for so long. It's super easy to do stop motion, visual effects in it. This is what we're going to use. Okay, But we will venture into um, Fusion in DaVinci Resolve, by the way. Okay, Photoshop. Now, um, forgive me, I'm going to turn my fan a little higher here. Fan system, let's make it high. Okay. So my computer is getting a little warm. The room's getting warm in here. Um, <clears throat> Photoshop is a major, 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 major uh, industry standard production software across the board in pretty much everything uh, from, um, from, what do you say, um, animation to live action. It is, it is a, a very popular software. It was one of the first uh, video manipulation softwares. It wasn't the first, by the way, but it was the one that really struck people by, by um, being able to offer a lot of functions and a lot of abilities to be able to do things uh, that you could not do in a um, photo software. So it kind of revolutionized photo softwares and that's why it's important. And that's why I have it here. We will do some work in Photoshop. In fact, whole productions, I've actually been on productions where the whole production was using Photoshop and um, wasn't my happiest experience, but it definitely worked. So I will show you some Photoshop techniques. Um, I will not be using a creative crowd, cloud spot most of the time. A lot of times I'll be using my personal um, edition that I own, the Creative Suite, uh, CS6 which is the last legal uh, personal own use software uh, version, but it has all the same layout, all the same functions. The newest CC versions of Photoshop and After Effects have some extra stuff in it, which I hope to actually demonstrate and show you. Um, that, that's kind of a cheat in a lot of ways for doing visual effects in stop, for stop motion or even live action. 
their rapid cheats. So in a way, we, we used to actually do things like rotoscoping shot by shot by shot by shot by shot and really close and then compositing background and blending and all this other stuff. Uh, After Effects actually has that built in now. Photoshop's had it in for many years. And I'm gonna show you some of that stuff. So stick tight, we'll actually get there. Close that window out. <clears throat> by the way, Photoshop and After Effects, you have to pay a monthly license fee. I think it's like $39 or something or $30 for the, for the monthly license fee to be able to use that software. Okay, um, let me go down here. Okay, now let's talk about get, getting organized. Um, so those are the softwares that we're, we're gonna potentially use. In fact, let's, uh, let me stop sharing, show you my face. Um, those are the softwares we're gonna use to start with. Um, one, of the, one of the big problems, however, is staying organized as a visual effects artist. Uh, if you are terrible at your organizational skills and if you're terrible at communication, um, I hope that this course, this class, will get you to a level where you can actually be very organized uh, or at least to a level of organization that you impress yourself that, you, that you've never been able to stay organized and be uh, committed to how you maintain order in your brain and in your desktop. Um, format for footage, format for um, visual effects, format for CGI, for stop motion, all those things are important and how we deal with a workflow are extremely, extremely important. It's, it's one of those things where um, if you're not organized, you'll get lost and the job will hurt, and meaning it hurts you mentally <laughs> and it will not be fun for you and you will suffer and your clients will suffer. And you don't want that. You wanna stay as organized as possible to be as fast as possible in a production. Um, the faster you are, the higher quality work that you produce, the more work you get. Um, that's one factor. The other factor is your personality. You need to have a really good personality to be able to work in a crew of, um, excuse the Espanol, but uh, cabrones. Um, so we, we wanna make sure that we're working politely and nicely with everybody else and not being able to find footage will cause bad relationships. So we want to, and being able to have clean and fast work creates really good relationships. So that is a very key part of working in visual effects, especially now in our modern day age where most things are online um, because of COVID-19 and because of the pandemia and the craziness in our world, a lot more work is actually being done, done at home, visual effects and animation wise, clean up. So to do that work, we can work out of our houses. We don't have to go to a studio and drive an hour, two hours or three hours to get to work. I actually used to drive a three hour commute to go to work on a, on a specific job because it was literally three cities over. Um, and then that would be a six hour commute and I would sleep maybe four hours a day. Sometimes I would actually sleep at the studio. Um, but those relationships that you build and the work that you build is all dependent upon how good you are and how well organized you are. And that will help your relationships. Okay, enough of that speech. Let's go to Asana. Okay, so organization software. There's a lot of them. And I'm gonna tell you right now that the two big ones that I like to use are Asana and Smartsheet. My favorite is actually Smartsheet, but I get into a lot of productions where they use Asana. And what's the difference? Uh, it's all in the layout and how they're organized. I don't, hmm, it's, it's one of those things where um, you can assign shots, meaning I have shot one, two, three, four, five, and I have five different people working for me. I need to, or I'm taking these shots. I assign shot one, two, three, four, five to X, Y, and Z of a person. So one, two, three, four, five persons. And then each one of those shots gets assigned a workflow. Please do this first, then do this, and then do this, and then do this. And then when you've done this, then you can turn it into me for review. That's how I work as a supervisor. Uh, when they send me that work, I can go through my checklist of what they had done, and I can check each stage and see what they've done and make sure that it's clean. Um, <clears throat> if it's not clean, I send it back to them, and I can send that through Asana. I say, you missed this, or you missed that. I can also put photographs into Asana and show where the flaws are, where the dots are. Where, um, where the flicker is, where the bounces are, where the chatter from the stop motion is, where it didn't key properly. So I can do all these various different things that, uh, and, and do it all in Asana to just demonstrate and explain. I've had it done to me. It's not the greatest feeling when you get a, a shot back from a, from a producer or a supervisor and they're like, you missed this. And you go, oh, 
oh, and there's a big circle on a big scratch or something in, uh, somewhere. Anyway, it's important though, because once they commu can communicate that to me, I can fix it, you know what I mean? Smartsheet is a little bit more in the regards, let's see, scroll down here. You can see here, it's got like workflow and areas. This is a really easy way to uh, assign shots to people along with giving them like um, uh, objectives throughout days. So on, on between this day and that day, you need to work on this. Between that day and this day, you need to work on this. You can see performance layouts and how well you're doing. Can, I can, um, I can assign, you can, as a, as a person, you can use either uh, like a, a, an employee or as a, um, a person on the crew, you can go bounce back and forth between like Asana and uh, Smartsheet and you can mark your work done and the supervisors can go back and look at what you've done. So those are two different kinds of softwares. They both cost money. Um, you can try Smartsheet for free, but if you're in a production and you wanna have something that's reliable to, to be able to do what you need to do and keep track of what you need to do, uh, those are the two best options. The other options that you can use, and I'm gonna click out of these because you don't need these, is to be able to use like Excel. You can use Excel to keep track of things. But really what we're talking about is keeping organized. You're staying organized and the people you're wor working with are staying organized. So they can actually access these sheets and, and update them and, and assign whatever they need to do. Um, if you are new to any of this, I highly suggest I don't see the other one that's on, it's supposed to be on here, but I highly suggest that you use Asana. Start with that one. That's a good area to start with. Um, really easy to organize and it's great to use with your crew of a visual effects, right? Um, the other one is monday.com. Not my favorite, but take a look at that one as well. Okay. Now that we're out of all that organizing and talking about uh, crazy softwares and whatever else, we've had an hour long lecture I'm going to probably spend the next 15 to 30 minutes talking to you about coordinates and why they're important. How do we define them? How do we find them? How do we plan for them? And how do we understand their incorporation into our workflow? Um, why is this important? First of all, well, when you do visual effects, you use a coordinate system. When you do After Effects, it's a coordinate system. When you do a CGI, Blender, any of those things, coordinate system. When you walk down the street and you jump off a curb, it's a coordinate system. When you're eating food, it's a coordinate system. So what is a coordinate system, John? Okay, well, coordinate system um, is X, Y, and Z. Um, X, Y, and Z stands for a direction. And we're building this coordinate system off of, off of technically six directions, okay? So let's start with uh, one, let's look at these arrows that, that I have in place because I'm gonna confuse the shit out of you, excuse my language, I'm gonna confuse the hell out of you, and then I am hopefully gonna inspire you and move you and propel you forward in animation because this is actually a, a very big part that a lot of people don't think of, all right? We measure in, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say this, in algebra, in calculus, in geometry, uh, in physics, an X, Y, and Z coordinate system. Now there's other coordinates. We can use other coordinates and other letters to dictate something. But a coordinate that we don't know is labeled with an X, a Y, or a Z to start with. Anything beyond that, we can add whatever else we want. A, B, C, D, whatever. But we start with X, Y, Z, okay? Why do we use, use X, Y, and Z? Well, it's because they have an actual set direction, okay? Uh, I'm gonna click this one here. Um, this is definitely gonna confuse the hell out of us. <laughs> so X, you see this here? Y, and then Z, okay? Technically, this is shoot, this little arrow pointing towards X also can be an arrow shorting, shooting backwards as well. This Y arrow, shooting towards the Y can also go backwards against itself, right? The Z can go north and south, all right? And those will be our X, Y, and Z coordinates within a 3D plane. I'm gonna make this even more confusing. You ready? There we go. There's a different way of looking at X, Y, and Z. Remember, if, you, if we look at this one, X is forward, Y is sideways, and Z is up. If I click on this, Y is up, X is sideways and Z is forward. Okay, 
why is this doing this this way? Well, for one, there's a specific set way that um, we look at X, Y, and Z in math. Y is, and I don't mean the question why, but Y is usually straight up and down, usually. X is left to right or right to left. C is forward and back, okay? Um, we can invert this and measure it in a different way. So in fact, what I will do is see, this is a, a really easier way to look at this. Um, this gives you the angle, here we go, boom. It's constantly changing, the orientation system. And what happens here is, this is the one that I use. I use Y, X, and Z, okay? This is how I was taught. When we're doing equations, we can actually plot uh, a space with three points. If anybody's ever watched, um, what is that? Um, Stargate. Stargate is a television show and a movie. Actually, the movie's great. Um, this television show is pretty cool also. Uh, they also use the light wave on that show, by the way. Um, but anyway, back to it. Um, Stargate talks about they only have two coordinate systems, two addresses. So let's say it's 0, 0, 5, 6, whatever. It's on X. 0, 0, 5, 2 on Z. They don't have the Y coordinate. So they can only plot in this plane here. And I'll show you the plane in a minute. Once they get the Y, that's a 2D plane, right? To actually plot a three-dimensional space, we need the Y coordinate. So to, to work within 3D space, we need to use three coordinates to be able to move in a space. All right, now that I've kind of made this kind of a confusing thing, let me unconfuse you here. I'm gonna just close that, there we go, close that just in case. This is light wave, okay? Um, light wave, like I said, is my go-to. It's my favorite software, all right? Um, why is it my favorite software? Uh, like I said, it's really fast to use. It's really easy to understand. I have written um, instructions here or, or buttons along the side and on the top. I can always find something. Um, in all the other softwares, I can't find anything. Um, Maya, 3D Studio, uh, 3D Studio Max actually has a, like a similar kind of interface. It's, it's easier, but it gets a little weird. You have to understand the terms for them. These are bare bones, basic terms. So um, you just read it and go, okay, yeah, I, I get where the graph editor is, you know? Okay, so what you're seeing here is three different windows. Um, let me change to a four window view uh, display. We'll do a four window view quad. There we go. And um, what I have here is my camera view. So I'm actually gonna change this to, uh, yeah, we'll do this because you can see down here the camera. And this is my perspective view down here in the lower left hand corner. Okay, and then we have top and upper right. We have back, which actually, and I'm gonna confuse you here, back it technically means front for, because uh, we're looking towards the back of the stage. Um, front means we're looking towards the front of the stage. Okay, so we're actually gonna do back. Um, and if you look down here in the lower left-hand corner of my perspective, I can actually, let me zoom back out. I can click on my camera here and I can actually move my camera and you get that kind of perspective with this camera shot up here. Okay, that being said, I'm gonna go here, whoops, and talk to you about 3D space. Okay, this is a three-dimensional space. In fact, let me click on the ball and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what's called a, uh, a focus. Uh, so I'm focusing in on this ball. So everywhere I move, I can move up and down, left and right, it's just gonna stay focused on that ball in the 3D space. Our coordinate system is laid out to us in colors here. We have Y, we have, uh, which is green. We have Z, which is blue. And we have X, which is red. This is how I was trained in algebra, um, what I've been trained in calculus. This is what I, I've known, or pre-calculus. This is what I've known, and in physics. I understand X, Y, and Z in this manner. If you get into other CGI softwares, they're going to flip the coordinate system on you sometimes. Just be aware that you need to prepare for that, okay? Okay, so right now we're technically at, if you, very lower uh, corner here where it says position X, Y, and Z. Very, very, very low corner. Very, 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 very low corner here. X, Y, and Z. I hope you can see that. Um, in fact, let me just bring it, see if I can bring it to the middle of the screen. 
this silly little thing here, okay? X, Y, and Z. These are our coordinates, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna focus in on those areas and, um, and watch as I move the sphere around. I'm gonna take uh, the green arrow, which is Y, and move it up. Okay, look, I, I moved 129.304 millimeters up in the Y direction. Now let me move it down past zero. It's now in the negative. So now we have an up or a down, all right? To go and we measure everything by zero. Everything starts out at zero, okay? So I'm gonna move up and then and past zero uh, in the positive, or I'm gonna move down past zero in the negative, okay? Once again, up, positive, down, negative, okay? Zero. Now I'm gonna rotate my camera a little bit so we get uh, the X axis on, uh, on the cross and the Z forward and back, okay? So X to the right is positive, past zero, reset to zero. X to the left is negative, past zero, okay? Very straightforward, very simple. Don't get lost, okay? So one way is positive, one way is negative, okay? If I move to the right positive, and I want to remove, let's say, 25 millimeters, I'm just gonna go here and I'm gonna type zero, zero, enter, and it's moved it back. So I've subtracted 25, getting back closer to zero, okay? That's X plane. I'm gonna reset this to zero plane, which means zero in the plane. Now Z is forward and back. Now I can't grab the arrow really, I, I get stuck. But I, it's letting me grab actually, okay. So, um, but we're not gonna do that. I'm actually gonna give you a different perspective here. I'm gonna go this way. The camera represents your eyeball, okay? Just pretend that that's your eyeball real quick. I'm gonna move the Z plane, the ball on the Z plane forward, and we get a negative, okay? So basically we're moving away from zero towards camera. And that is zero, uh, we're moving in the negative. If I move forward past zero, I get into the positive numbers, okay? I gotta go back to zero again. So moving it towards camera or towards your view or, um, or backwards technically is negative. Moving it forward is positive. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, I'll tell you why. If you're tracking an object in three-dimensional space and stop motion, because stop motion most of the time is three-dimensional space. In fact, the majority, I'd say 95% of the time, including when you're doing 2D animation with cutout or whatever, you will actually have to deal with a three-dimensional space. It's gonna drive you crazy when you're tracking things and you don't understand why something is moving the way it is because it's moving in that three-dimensional space. It could be bouncing. It could be, your camera could be shaking. Your camera is actually a big factor for understanding this because your camera, when you get into bump, when things bump the camera, like your feet or your arms or your hands bump the camera or the cat, uh, and you have to reset the camera, chances are you never ever get it back to the original zero plane. It's moved and you have to figure out, and I'm not talking CG, I'm talking actually real cameras here. It, it will move and you will not be able to get the camera back to perfect space. You will have to use a software to fix that. And many times you will find out that you've bumped the camera after you've done the production. You're like, why is, it, why is my shot shaking so much? Oh, I've been stepping on the floor and the camera has been moving because I'm on a wood floor. So there's a lot involved. Um, the good news is the software makes it really easy for you to figure out. Um, the bad news is if you don't understand this concept, um, you're gonna be hurting in the long run. The other, the other thing to consider here is when you're doing any kind of compositing of an object, <clears throat> the software needs points to actually have reference to. When you're doing stop motion in a 3D environment, meaning you have a stage and a set, and you have objects attached to a, an, a stop motion puppet, so to speak, or a, uh, let's, for example, you have a, a sign that is attached to a, um, a briefcase, or a face that is attached to a puppet that's, that the face gets animated CGI. You have to have points for which the software to see where those points um, are in 3D space. It measures all that. Then you can actually go, okay, well, this is roughly here locked to that and the software should actually see 
x, y, and z and be able to lock to that um, um, coordinate. If there's something off, let's say the face pops off of your character, your CGI face pops off for one frame, you need to know why and know how to fix that. Same thing with tracking uh, a, a flat object to an object, X and Y are important, uh, Z not so much sometimes. So there's a lot of different things to get involved with. Another one and probably the last kind of thing to talk about is fire and smoke and brimstone and water. Um, when you're dealing with compositing of elements, X, Y, and Z is very important because those elements do not move in just a 2D plane. They move in a three-dimensional plane. For compositing purposes, you need to know where that's going to sit. Uh, we'll get into tracking and, and how to approach those and how to deal with those, but that's really where uh, we need to uh, address and look at. Okay. I um, think that's pretty good. That's a lot of information for you. Really, uh, it's going to bombard you with the first class. Uh, it's almost, uh, it's about an hour, 20 minutes. So um, I want to leave, um, leave this open really quick for the, the um, students participating in the class who actually showed up for the, the lecture here um, to, to ask questions. I think I have, there we go, there's a chat. Um, so please, um, do, <laughs> okay, yeah. James wants me to talk about frame rates and we will talk about frame rates in the next class because it gets really intense. Um, this codex. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, James was asking if we talk about frame rates. But does anybody, let me, uh, let me get out of, stop sharing the screen. Does anybody have a question? Please type it in here and I will unmute your microphone if you have a question. Um, in fact, I will just go through the people here and see um, if anybody wants to have a quick chat uh, and if they're confused about anything. So first I'm gonna start with James. Um, I ask you to unmute your microphone, buddy. Hold on. Can you hear me? Yeah, James. How you doing? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Cool. Are you confused yet? <laughs> Overwhelmed. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to understand what um, is this like absolutely necessary that we, you know, that we know about all of this if we're going to do stop motion, the visual effects side. For yes. That reason, yeah? right. Yes. And um, if if you want to do it right. Um, yeah. If you want to do it wrong, um, yeah, <laughs> you need to know this. I, this is, so put it to you this way, um, coordinates, and you're talking about coordinates specifically, right? Yeah. Okay, think of it this way. Um, you're walking forward, that mm. is on, forward and back is on X, no, on Z, sorry, forward and back is on Z. Right. Left and right is on X, and up, yeah. and, up and down is on Y. And if yeah. you, and if you ever get lost and you're ever confused and you can't remember that, just go on the internet and look it up. That's, I, can, right, yeah. I can tell you that the internet is a huge massive resource for us visual effects artists because we're mm. constantly stealing other people's work. Not, I should say work, but other people's techniques. You don't steal yeah. somebody's work, that's wrong, that's horrible. Never steal somebody's work. Always give them credit for what they do. But you can take their technique and apply it to what you're doing. Yeah. So don't ever be afraid of that. Um, right. Yeah. No, I got I got the basic idea of it, uh, the X Y Z thing. Um, it's just I don't know. I'm just thinking ahead. I am. You know, it's so overwhelming, isn't it? What's to come? You know, all the stuff you've got to learn, all the stuff you've got to do in order to get you know what you're trying to do done. Yeah. So it's just overwhelming. Well, it will be at first. Right now. <laughs> it will be at first, and you'll have some tears. You'll cry a little bit here and there. I believe me, and I have. I've actually. I can't tell you how many times I've actually turned on the computer to start working on something and just wept mm. because I'm like, yeah, but, uh, I don't <laughs> understand the concept and it's just not working and I have to turn in my job. I have to finish the job and I haven't, I haven't figured out what I'm doing, you know, cause it's a whole new software or it's a whole new workflow or something didn't happen uh, the way it was supposed to. And I have to reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah. So there are a lot of instances in my experience in visual effects where I've actually I've had breakdowns and cried <laughs> because, <laughs> because it was too complex for me to kind of figure out. Um, but the, the easy answer to solve those problems is mm. actually to, um, to take a breath and relax and go on a walk. Um, yeah. If you're stuck, take a walk, man. Just take a walk. Mm. You know, separate yourself from the computer. Take a break. It's not sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Take a break. And yeah. um, when, you, when working in visual effects, when I worked in visual effects at the studios, we would mm. work 16 hours. Some, I've worked jobs where I worked for 72 hours almost straight. I wow. take maybe an hour nap every five hours. Um, yeah. 
And yeah, so you actually, you get into weird production schedules, uh, weird stuff with visual effects. But mm -hmm. in, in all honesty, it's not that hard once you get the core basic principles. And then at, from that point, you start teaching yourself. Um, there's a lot of technical stuff that, that you can ignore. Yeah. So, uh, and I'm gonna provide some of that stuff that you could probably ignore, but, okay. you, can, but you cannot ignore the X, Y, and Z coordinates. They're right. really, they're really important. Um, and like I said, if you get lost, always just go on the internet and just look it up. It's not that hard to find. Um, yeah. And once you get that, if you've had problems with any kind of math in your life, uh, algebra, you know, trigonometry, calculus, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, if you've passed algebra, you should get the X, Y, Z coordinates. Uh, but if you have problems with, let's say algebra, uh, X, learning this X, Y, and Z, will open the door for you for like, oh, wow, I understand how this math works. I'm figuring out three different locations that equal one point in space, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure you're gonna have questions for me. I'm not worried about it. Bring them, yeah? <laughs> All right. All right, thanks, James. I'm gonna move on to the next person, okay? Yeah, okay, okay, thanks. Talk to you later, bye. Um, I'm gonna move to Bonnie, ask Bonnie to unmute. Hi Bonnie, how are you? Hey John, how are you? I'm good, do you have any questions? Uh, let me see, I'm, I'm wondering if you're gonna actually cover this, but he just said that even if like, if, I, if I'm doing stop motion and I accidentally bump the camera and you cannot get it back to that perfect spot again, which has happened, mm -hmm. he said you could fix it later. And I was like, ooh, okay, how do you do that? So as I- We're gonna do that. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to cover that. What, what software would that be in? Well, we can do it in a couple of different softwares. Um, the one I'm going to use is After Effects. Um, I'm going to try to show you how to do it in a free software, um, but the results are not going to be necessarily the same. Um, After Effects is probably the easiest one to do it in, uh, but there are quite a few actual other softwares that you could stabilize within. So. Uh, but After Effects is probably the cheapest one budget-wise, other than a free software like uh, uh, Fusion. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no, I was just, I, when you started the coordinates, I was like, oh God. And then actually by the end of it, I was like, okay, this is, this is good. I'm, get, I'm starting to get this a little bit because I've used Maya and I've, the, the XYZ is just, it just goes over my head sometimes and I zone out, but this was, I actually needed to listen to this, so thank you. <laughs> oh, you got it. Well, you know, one like I said to James, once you get the X, Y, Z coordinates, you will, um, you will definitely it'll it'll be to your advantage. And then when you get into stabilization of your cameras, it'll definitely help a great deal. So you'll understand why something is getting bigger in the camera after you bumped it. Like, why did that get bigger? Oh, it's because my cameras moved forward, and I can shrink it down a little bit. You know. Yeah. Um, there's things called warp stabilizers and, and motion trackers that we're going to use. So. Okay, cool. cool. That was awesome. it. It was just, yeah, just a part about the, X, the XYZ coordinates and hitting the camera. I was like, just uh, I, on that. I, 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 let me tell you, before we had this uh, ability to, to fix those, many an animator cried and had to redo their shot. So. Wow. Yeah, you, onion, skin, onion skin is great if you mess up with the puppet. Yeah. But the camera, I was like, no. Yeah, I tried to get it back and I could never get it back. Yeah, it has to do with post process. You'll never get it back per perfectly. Okay, so. thanks, John. You got it. Talk to you later. Thanks. Okay. Next, I'm going to go to Chad. Let me see. That's Chad. I'm mute. Yep, Chad. I'm off. Hey, how are you? Oh, pretty good. You uh, got any so, um, I mean, I've used uh, like other modelers, like, uh, you know, ZBrush and 3DS Max, um, AutoCAD. You know, earlier versions of that. I've never used Lightwave before, so mm -hmm. that would be a little bit new to, but I've seen it. I just never used that one. Uh, Dragon Frame, I used, I think, an earlier version, so I don't, okay. it's been a while since I've touched that one. I think that had, didn't that have the ability to remove, like if, if you were doing um, an armature in there, or actually like a, a wire guide, and then you could green screen and remove that out? Was that? That was Stop Motion Pro. That was Stop Motion um, Pro, that was okay. Yeah, Dragon Frame allows you to preview some of that, but you can't, maybe you can export it, but it's not a professional level of uh, uh, visual effects compositing because it's not what it's meant for. It's meant for more pre-visualization. So you can chroma key something out, but it's not perfect, it's not ideal. 
So. Yeah, the biggest issue that I've always had where I'll have a lot of interest is getting the key for the lighting right, especially when doing the chroma key, yeah. uh, where there's hair or feathers or something that's really difficult and you get that splashback coming back in and yeah. then you get that little bit of a halo effect or yeah. a line, you can see it and being able to really get the lighting just right. Yeah, there's some cheats to that. Um, I, I can tell you I've done a lot of work where um, – the director of photography set up these beautiful shots and then the animator did a beautiful job with the animation. But for some reason, they somehow got um, into the depth of the field, depth of field where they were a little out of focus and it fuzzed out the whole character that had fur and hair. And then I had to go in there and, and basically fix everything by frame by frame by frame to actually get it to work. Last month I was doing a, a live stream here for a local historical society and the author he actually i told him here's your position stay there we had a uh, green screen behind him he had the chroma, chroma key i was doing it live yeah. and he had a tendency to keep stepping forward Ooh. so just like you were saying right there it gets out and then all of a sudden the lighting the backsplash you could see it and then also he would gesture with his arms really wide oh. so I had to actually build a, almost like a digital frame door that he was standing behind because his arms would go past the edges of it. So that was oh, no. kind of a little bit of a problem uh, as I, well. I like whenever doing something live like that, I like to have them sit, <laughs> you know, so that way they don't move. Um, sometimes you move forward a little bit, but they, you can't, you can't get them walking around, you know? Yeah. And it, he had a tendency to do that. He was moving almost like two feet in different directions and it was like, that was kind of awful. Yeah. Um, that's it. That's a device that people use to, to calm themselves down when they're doing speeches. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> and I think uh, the other issue that I have interest in is the like keyframe to sound and audio, uh -huh. uh, especially when I'm doing compressing uh, videos back down for streaming like on-demand videos. Okay. They have a tendency if they're really long, I start getting the audio out of sync uh, at, at times. And when that I put sounds, it into. That sounds like a frame rate conversion issue. Yeah, exactly. And so I've, if there's good techniques for handling that or how to do that with different software packages. Ooh, that's a, that's an interesting one. Um, I've done a lot of that. So it's, um, there's a thing called a three, two pull down. Um, look it up. That's the best way I can describe it for you. Just look it up. A three, two pull down. Um, okay. That is uh, basically dealing with the conversion from the, t uh, for instance, I did a feature film where they shot the whole film in 24 frames per second. They allowed the, lead actor to assist them and capturing the footage onto hard drives. This is back when we had tape. He caught, he captured all the footage back at 30 frames per second. So we actually had extra frames per um, shot or per, or yeah, per second. And this audio sync went way out as we got it. So then I had to bring that back in and, and knock it to 24 frames per second. Then we had a visual effects company doing the work. Um, and I got into this film late. So I actually came in to fix all the problems with this film. It's usually, people called me to, to fix their problems. It's a really weird thing. But for visual effects specifically, it's always like, fix this, fix this, save me. So um, I got into the film halfway through the, uh, the post-production of the film. The visual effects a company that was doing that was also doing the edit. And they were doing the visual effects um, to the 30 frames per second and doing all their edits to the 30 frames per second. And then when I got the footage, I told them that everything was out of sync, um, that they had holds on every, I think it was every 24 frames, they had a certain amount of hold frames. And I literally had to go in there and do what's called a three, two pull down, and then go and clean up all the shots uh, and then tweak all the visual effects. Um, so I literally, it took me three months um, Took me three months initially and then took me eight months at the end of it all uh, to save that film and get it to release. Um, so, and it was just me at that point. The visual effects uh, people quit uh, because they were, it was a brand new company. They had never done visual effects before. Um, and they were also the first time ever doing editing. Uh, really stupid to hire a company like that with no work experience. And um, I ended up going in and, and redoing everything, edit, sound effects and, and um, a lot of other stuff. And then we handed it off to color correction and a post house that actually specifically did uh, clean up for um, color. So, and, and I, I could walk you through that, but that would probably be like a separate 
think probably closer to the end of our uh, end delivery when we talk about delivery for the visual effects course, because we probably should address that. And I can give you more depth of that story and I can actually set up a scenario for you. It's really easy to set up uh, failures and then try to fix those failures. So, okay, and, oh, yeah. and one, of, one of the other things too that we're gonna talk about and discuss and work on is, um, is dealing with, um, uh, sorry, I lost my, I lost what I was gonna say there, but uh, dealing with uh, problem solving in a manner that uh, a lot of people don't address. So we're just doing a lot of problem solving. It's a lot of what we do in visual effects, fixing their problems. So. Okay, so thanks, Chad. I, uh, anything else? No, no, that's it. Perfect, I will, uh, I'm gonna mute you now. Okay, thanks again. All right, next, uh, I'm actually gonna answer Cynthia, let's see. I'm really looking forward to learning how to deal with Flickr. Is Flickr free for digital anarchy a good plugin to use? All right, Cynthia, I'm gonna unmute you. Hold on, see if you can talk to me. Maybe you don't have a microphone, but let's see. Hi, Cynthia, okay. how are you? Hi, uh, how are you? I'm good, so uh, Flickr free. Um, Flickr free is useful half the time. Uh, Flickr is an issue that is caused by a lot of different issues. We're going to talk about Flickr a lot in actually one whole class is just going to be dedicated to Flickr um, and fixing Flickr and we're going to solve and, and address it. Uh, I will, I don't know if I even have the Flickr free plugin on the other computers, but um, we will probably deal with Flickr free. Um, and there's some other ones that I, uh, Granite Bay D Flickr is the one that I, I really like. Uh, the, the issue with these plugins, these deflickering plugins, is I won't say that they're smart and I won't say that they're stupid, but they have no brains. They just do a, a color spectrum analysis within a grid and then they try to match the colors within that grid and the hue and the luminance. So uh, we will talk a lot about that in the upcoming class. Um, if you were to buy a deflickering software or plugin, that might be a good one to choose. Um, I've used it but it's not my favorite. So any okay. other questions? Any other um, questions? No, not right now. I wasn't aware that math would be involved in this lesson. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it really freaked me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, the level of math that we're going to do, we're not going to do any algebra. Um, the, okay. the, technically the algebra, algebra, the calculus and the, and the uh, physics are all done for us. We don't have to do any of that. We, <laughs> I just give you the coordinates, probably the most heavily intense math that we're going to get into is coordinates. Um, actually, no, I take it back. It's going to probably freak out everybody, but we're going to do frame rate conversions in frame rates. Oh, no. um, <laughs> but I, I've actually had a whole talk with James about this. Uh, he was in my animation course and uh -huh. I had a whole talk with James about this and uh, frame rates. Uh, I'm, I'm prepared to, to talk to you about this <laughs> in a way that you've never looked at frame rates before. So <laughs> don't worry, I got you covered, okay? So okay. The, the, the thing that I think um, that's probably the scariest is gonna be uh, the codex. The codex is probably the scariest thing, but nothing else is really scary. And, and in fact, codecs are not that scary. We have presets for codecs. We just stick, we click a button and we have it, we're set, so don't worry. Okay. All right. You say so. I say so. <laughs> Believe me. Trust me. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, guys. I am going to stop this. We are actually at 4:35. Uh, it's been about an hour and a half, um, and we should be able to um, meet around the same time every Saturday um, for this class. Uh, for those people that are um, the people that are in my Zoom session here are actually uh, students that have signed up for the course. But if you want to sign up for the course and watch the other lectures and be part of the class and earn your certificate in visual effects for stop motion animation, which is really useful, honestly, because it can, um, it can be a talking point in your resume for being hired for doing this kind of work or working in stop motion. Or if you wanna do this uh, for your own productions, it's actually really useful, uh, but you can sign up at stopmotionuniversity.com. If you have any questions, you can contact me at contact at stopmotionuniversity.com. Uh, that's my email address. And um, we should hopefully have this class at around the same time every, um, every Saturday for the next six to eight weeks. And um, the other thing too is at the beginning of uh, August, the first weekend in August is actually um, a director's workshop with Barry Purves. So we actually will probably skip class that week uh, for the weekend for Saturday and Sunday um, because that will be Barry Purves' uh, He's a famous director. If you don't know who he is, he directed Wind of the Wills as the animation director. Um, he is um, 
he's Academy Award nominated, so he's nominated for Oscars uh, or an Oscar, and was also uh, nominated. I think he won BAFTA awards. Uh, he's won numerous awards around the world. He's worldwide renowned, recognized uh, animator and director, and also uh, a thespian. So he loves theater and he talks about theater. A uh, very sweet guy. Um, he's going to have a, um, a lecture on that weekend. Uh, discounted rate for students, non-discounted rate for uh, non-students. So uh, I hope that you can attend that. And uh, yeah, so we're going to go from there. I'm going to say thank you. And I will see you in the next class. If you have questions, email me. Do not be afraid. I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can with those, with those answers. Okay. And thank you. And I will uh, hopefully see you guys in the next class. Bye.